Well, we're going to continue our examination of the, the book of Job. And uh, just as a reminder from last week, one of the things that we learned right up front in the book of Job is that he was a righteous man. Interesting thing to think about. And actually later we're going to get a little bit more into that. What does it mean that he was a righteous man? Does that mean he was without sin? Job chapter 1 verse 1 tells us that this, in the land of Uz there was a man whose name was Job and he was blameless and upright. He feared God and shunned evil. And I think we should note when we think about his righteousness, it was not a righteousness just because he was a, a good person. There, were, there was something behind that righteousness. It, it tells us that he feared God and because he feared God, what did he do? He shunned evil. And I, I would suggest that motivation is an is a important element. There's people that are good people, but the fear of the Lord is what really should cause us to, to think about what we do be, before we do it. Proverbs 9.10 says, we won't bring the slide up, it says, the fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. Knowledge of the Holy One is understanding. And, and Job feared God. And we, don't like to, we don't like that, by the way. I don't want to fear God. Well, yeah, if we stood before God right now, we'd be shooken up. <laughs> It, 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 it's a holy fear, I might say. And, and his righteousness that is written of, the, the inspired author was not biased. He was not saying, well, I'm going to highlight um, Job you know, because I think he's a great person. He goes, verse 8 tells us that that was God's opinion as well. God said, he was, remember he was talking to Satan. There was the, the heavenly host were standing before God and, and Satan was there with him too. And he, he asked, uh, God asked him, have you, where have you been? And he said, I've been roaming about the earth. He says, have you considered, have you considered my servant Job? And, and when he asked him that, he said, because there's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears God and shuns evil. So that's God's opinion too. And as a result of that encounter that Satan had with God and, and the challenge that he makes about God, about Job's righteousness. Oh, he, he's only righteous because you give him everything. He only, he only treats you in fear because you've given everything. And, you know, if, he, if, you, lose, if you take it all away from him, he's going to curse you to, to your face. And so as a result of that challenge, God gives Satan permission, and Job loses it all. He loses his wealth, he loses his children, and he loses his health. And we talked about last week that even... His wife, who endured the, the same struggles herself, it was her children that were lost as well, but what did she say to, to Job? Are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. <laughs> husbands, how would you like to hear that from your wife? Wives, how would you like to hear that from your husbands? <laughs> Just give it up. Don't hold to your integrity. And so, even with that lack of respect, let's say, and that challenge from his wife, even after losing his wealth and his children, the scripture tells us that Job still praised God. The Lord gives and the Lord takes away. Praise be the name of the Lord. And in response to his, his wife's challenge, don't maintain your integrity, curse God and die, he said, should we accept good from God and not trouble? He had a, a good understanding, a good worldview. You know, trouble comes. So last week, we, we looked at that initial response of the three friends, Eliphaz, Bildad, and Zophar. And, and they had heard of Job's trouble. I was doing a little bit of research and found, the, and there's a, there's a lot of unknowns about the book of Job from its standpoint of archaeology and things like that. But what they can discern is the area. What is, what is this land of whose? It, it was not a city. It was a region. Most likely, and there's some different viewpoints on it, most likely it was somewhere in that southern area uh, around Edom. But it was an expansive area. And these, these people, these friends, came from different spots even within that. But they had to take a hike to get there. It wasn't like, you know, a two-minute walk. They, they had to go out of their way to go there. And they heard that, that Job was in, was in trouble, that he was struggling, and, and they agreed together to go and see him. And when they arrived, what did they see? They saw a broken man, a man that was so disfigured from soles, from sores and scabs. It says from the soles of his feet to the top of his head. It, was, it indicated from the Scripture that it was probably something that was extremely itchy, and he used to take shards of pottery 
and scrape. Have you ever, have you ever had those? I, I, I did some, I'm going off text here. I, I did some house sitting and, and dog sitting for one of my daughters. And this dog just wanted to sleep on top of me in the bed that I'm sleeping in. And he would get up scratching like crazy and things like that. And finally, I kicked him out, made him sleep in the hallway. But uh, I woke up and I had bites on my arm. I said to my daughter, I, said, I, I think your dog has fleas. She goes, no, he has sensitive skin. I said, well, his sensitive skin is getting me because <laughs> I, I had these bites. And I had bites you know, like that. And it got so, it, it, it itched so much that I was taking anything I could find. Uh, you know, a, a, a hard brush. It, you know, have you ever had that? It, you were just driving you nuts? It was tenfold worse for Job, taking those shards of pottery and just uh, scratching. So, I mean, he was disfigured, and they, they, when they saw him, they, they didn't even recognize him. But the scripture says that they spent seven days and seven nights fasting and grieving with their friend. And I said last week that they got it right that often silence and tears with a grieving friend are the best consolation we give somebody. Sometimes just a, a silent prayer and a warm hug. No judgment. Ears ready to hear. And so for seven days and seven nights, their friends consoled Job in their silence. But then in chapter 3, we find that Job breaks the silence. He, he is suicidal he is wishing that he had never been born. He is angry, and he sees his plight as something that God has either allowed or has caused. We'll bring these slides up. Uh, this is uh, this chapter 3, verses 23 through 26. I had to remember where it came from. This is what Job said. Why is life given to man whose way is hidden, whom God has hedged in? For sighing has become my daily food. My groans pour out like water. What I feared has come upon me. What I dreaded has happened to me. I have no peace, no quietness, no rest, but only turmoil. That's, that's a grieving guy. And he's looking outward, and he's saying, I don't know where this is coming from, but God has hedged me in. And the silence now broken by Job elicited a response from the friends. And so we're going to talk about the speeches of Eliphaz and Bildad and Zophar as they deliver a message that if you just kind of look at them in a big picture, they deliver this very rigid, retributive justice of God. And they said that, that's the answer to your losses and troubles. God repays evil. And he's going to, he, you're going to get what you're due. That's ultimately, in a nutshell, what they're saying in, in large part. And, and I think... Their stances are more than just a simple reading might imply. Perhaps there was some self-righteousness on their own part. <laughs> yeah, you're going through this and I'm not. You must be, you must be the one that's bad. And, and you can find, as you read the different speeches of the three, there's another one, Eliku, which we're not going to get in today, but if you read the, the speeches of those three, you'll, you'll see that some areas you could say, well, that's a true statement. You know, that's, that's in, in, in a vacuum, that's, that's a true statement. But their opinions were not aware of the spiritual warfare that was at the root of the attack on Job. They, they weren't aware of what's going on in this bigger picture, so their pointing of fingers was, was, was not valid, even though some of the things they said about God, how God punishes evil, yes, but it's not in this vacuum of what's going on in Job's life. And the first friend to speak is that man named Eliphaz, and he, he sets out the, the fundamental or the overarching view, maybe I'd call it, that um, kind of indicates or drives the overall opinion of all of that, of that group, the three friends. And that, that, that overarching statement is that God blesses those who walk righteously, but he brings curses and destruction on sinners. It's just that. If you're righteous, everything's going to go good. If you're evil, God's going to create punishment. And ultimately, God will punish the evildoers. But again, that statement's in a vacuum. So there's some truth to it, but it's truth without the full context. So although I'm going to focus on 
the three speeches, the emphasis is going to be on Eliphaz because it kind of guides where they all come through. Then I'm going to intersperse some of the input from Bilzad and Zophar. And so chapter 4 is what begins with Eliphaz's response after Job has basically unleashed his suicidal thoughts and why is God doing this type of thing. Eliphaz, the the Temanite, replied, and this is up on the screen, if someone ventures a word with you, will you be impatient? But who can keep from speaking? Think of how you have instructed many, how you have strengthened feeble hands, Your words have supported those who have stumbled. You have strengthened faltering knees. But now trouble comes to you and you are discouraged. It strikes you and you are dismayed. Should not your piety be your confidence and your blameless ways your your hope? Some people will read that and say he was being sarcastic. I don't think he was being sarcastic. I think he was being genuine in his recognition of Job's encouragement to others because the scripture tells us that Job was a righteous man blameless in all his ways and I and I think Eliphaz was openly recognizing that saying hey you've helped people now you're the one that needs help and and isn't your piety isn't that shouldn't your let's change that isn't your faith which should hold your confidence so I don't think he was being sarcastic he he ultimately where he starts to go wrong is he starts to present himself as the the chief authority that, that his understanding of God is exactly what Job needs to listen to. Um, it doesn't appear, even though he's kind of like, I'm, I'm the one with the answers, it doesn't appear that he's unsympathetic to Job. Think of how you've, you've handled, helped people, Job. I, I think he understood, and quite frankly, those seven days and seven nights are going to have an impact on him. So I don't think he was unsympathetic. I don't think he was being sarcastic. I think he was just saying, I know the answer. And, and Eliphaz feels like he is going to correct what he sees as Job's erroneous complaints. And throughout his speeches, he's, he's referencing, without saying exactly where they came from, he's referencing various sources of, of superior wisdom. Wisdom tells us this and things like that. And apparently he claims that his remarks are divinely inspired. Job chapter 4, verses 12 through 16. Eliphaz says, A word was secretly brought to me. My ears caught a whisper of it. Amid disquieting dreams in the night, when deep sleep falls on people, fear and trembling seized me and made all my bones shake. A spirit glided past my face, and the hair of my body stood on end. It stopped, but I could not tell what it was. A form stood before my eyes, and I heard a hushed voice. We later learn that that hushed voice that Eliphaz heard was, was not from God. I'm not going to put this scripture up, but it's in, Psalm, excuse me, in Job 42, verse 7. It records what God says to those three friends. And it says that God said to Eliphaz the Temanite, I am angry with you and your two friends because you have not spoken of me what is right as my servant Job has. And when I read that, I find myself saying we need to be careful to test the words that we speak or the things that we think we discern. Satan loves to stir up dissension. He loves to whisper in our ears, oh, that that person's wrong. Oh, you're better than that person. Whatever he whispers, we need to make sure we differentiate between is that the voice of God or is that the voice of, of, of the liar? Bildad and Zophar's speeches are going to be filled with accusation, threat, and judgment. And it may be easy for us on the outside looking in to discount their words, yet Eliphaz does seem to offer some level of compassion. In his second speech, there's three speeches of Eliphaz, in his second speech, his words might even sound wise and compassionate. I don't think I put these, these verses up. Um, Job 5, 7, and 8, I don't think I put that up. It says, Yet man is born to trouble, and as surely as sparks fly upward, but if I were you, I would appeal to God. I would lay my cause before him. Those words on their own are accurate. Good things or bad things happen to good people, right? I, can I hear an amen on that? <laughs> 
Bad things do happen to good people. Matthew chapter 5, again, not going to bring this verse up. Matthew chapter 5, verse 45 says, God causes the sun to rise on evil and good and sends rain on the righteous and the unrighteous. And even though that is true, under Job's circumstances, what, what he's going through, which we have the privy of knowing what's going on, saying to him, stuff happens, does not help. <laughs> you, you, don't need, you don't need someone to say to you after you're going through stuff, oh yeah, just, yeah, good things happen to bad people, or bad things happen to good people. You, it, it, you're not going to be helpful to that person. And Satan loves to twist God's word and create doubt. The accusations are, you are bad, and therefore this is what's going on to you. God is repaying you for your evil. And yet all three friends are just unaware of this war waging against Job. An innocent man. A, a man who feared God and was shunning evil. And perhaps it is a reminder to all of us that when we see our friends or our family going through struggles, there might be something behind it that we don't understand. Mental illness, bad choices, external pressures, even spiritual warfare, something we tend to discount. I, I have some people that are going through some struggles because of mental illness that just takes a hold of them and, and sometimes believers say to them, well, it must be sin in your life. That's not helpful. That's not helpful. We need to be careful not to make conclusions without understanding. And it seems to me that Eliphaz and Bildad and, and Zophar, everything, everything is, is black and white. Do you, do you know people, do you know believers like that? Everything's black and white? Yeah, we, we run into that. God is just, so you must be unjust and you must be getting what you're due. That's why you're having these problems. You need to repent without knowing what the cause is. Eliphaz's third speech climaxes with this call to repentance, which he says that if you repent, guess what? It's going to be, you're going to have prosperity. Everything's going to be great. Sometimes it's not. What, what, did, what did Jesus say? That, that if, you, if you walk with him, that you will be persecuted, Right? Troubles, troubles will come. It's not always a necessary, it's not always an issue that you haven't repented. And so with all this, this back and forth between Job and his three friends, Eliphaz kind of, again, comes out as the chief authority. He, think, he thinks he speaks for them all. He, he says, we have all examined this, and this is true. So hear it and apply it to yourself. God's justice. You're evil. That's what it's all about. In his third speech, it seems that the compassion he had in the beginning is all gone. We'll bring these slides up. Job chapter 22, verses 4 through 10. This is Eliphaz speaking. Is it for your piety that he rebukes you and brings charges against you? Is not your wickedness great? Are not your sins endless? You demanded security from your relatives for no reason. You stripped people of their clothing, leaving them naked. You gave no water to the weary. You withheld food from the hungry. Though you were a powerful man owning land and an honored man living on it, and you set widows away empty-handed and broke the strength of the fatherless, that is why snares are all around you, why sudden peril terrifies you. Wow, what a rebuke. What happened to the compassion? And where did those charges come from? The, all those evil things. That he, did, didn't, did he forget how he stoped, started his first speech saying how he instructed many and how you strengthened those with feeble hands and how your words supported those who stumbled? You're a great guy. But as Job continued to make his defense between those speeches, he starts getting angry. He, he's not accepting what we're saying. And then he just unloads on him. Perhaps, and again, we'll get into a, some of their statements, but Bildad and Zophar, they're just throwing accusations. You're evil, you're evil, you're evil. Maybe those words influenced Eliphaz. Peer pressure. Boy, they're, they're jumping on, they're jumping on. I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join the fray. 
I think Eliphaz's major mistake was he saw himself as the authority. I know what this is all about because I, I heard a voice. And I know that your struggles are, are your own fault. And if only, Job, if only you could see your sin and turn to God, this would all go away. Everything would be fine. Some valid points that out of the context of what's going on could be true, but miss the point under the circumstances. And so sometimes the truth can be like the rubbing salt in the wound. And, and I think we have to be careful about You know, this is somewhat on a periphery, but I find it easy to judge. You know, this is, this is a minor example, but I, I, had to, I had to meet Thomas to drop something off for him to, to work with the sound system yesterday, and I, I was at the, we met in the parking lot in BJ's and Henrietta, and after that I said, you know what, I deserve a strawberry milkshake from Chick-fil-A. So I picked up a strawberry milkshake from Chick-fil-A, and I'm driving back, and there's a, a car behind me as I pull out in the, onto the street, and I get into my lane, and I want to get one more lane over, and so I put my blinker, and the, the guy behind me zooms up to get in front of me, blocks me so I can't make the lane change. But my immediate response was, and I said it out loud, idiot. <laughs> I've done the same thing. <laughs> I've got to get in this lane now, because if I don't get in the lane, the light's going to be... But man, it was very easy for me to... Idiot. And I, I kind of want to look at snarl at him, but I didn't. Yeah, I didn't want to go that far. It, it's so easy to judge without knowing what's going on. You know, that's a trivial one example I gave, but, you know, maybe this person had to be somewhere by a certain time and just needed to get there. Maybe he wasn't even looking and seeing my blinker, whatever. But it was very easy for me to jump on him. And yes, he was wrong. My golly, I hope he gets a flat tire. <laughs> it's so easy for us to do that. And, and if you consider... Job's responses between each of his, his friends' speeches, you'll, you'll see he was a man tormented and confused as any one of us would be. If you've tried to live according to God's will in your life and things just seem to be going backwards every time, yeah, you're going to be confused. Some of the statements that he made, we won't put these up, but some of the statements that Job made, if only my anguish could be weighed, and my misery placed on scales. It would surely outweigh the sand of the seas. No wonder my words have been impetuous. That's, a, that's heavy. <laughs> if, if everything I'm going through could be weighed, sand of the seas, you're talking big stuff. He said, oh, that I might have my request that God would grant what I hope for, that God would be willing to crush me. Whoa. Yeah, that's, that goes back to that suicidal. I wish I was dead. But now he's saying, God, just if, if, you're, if you're doing this, if this is then, then just, just crush me and get it over with me. And, and Job knew that he had not turned from God. In all that he did, he, he knew, although he was, he was very direct, let me stand before my accuser. Let me make my case. He was direct, but he, he knew that he still feared God. And he knew that even in death, he says that I have not denied the words of the Holy One. Even if I go to the grave, I know I'm going to the grave never having denied the words of the Holy One. Then comes Bildad. And his response when he heard Job's complaints and the various things Job said between Eliphaz's comments, he is just brutal when he dumps on Job. He says, how long will you say such things? Your words are a blustering wind. Does God pervert justice? Does the Almighty pervert what is right? When your children sinned against him, he gave them over to the penalty of their sin. Wow. Can you imagine telling someone who just lost his or her children to a building that collapsed that they got what they deserved for? Your kids are dead because they sinned. Wow. I, I tell you, that's when I would lose it. And, and that's when my wrath would be on someone to say something like that. Don't know any of the background. Don't know anything that's going on. Your kids died because they sinned. 
Bildad makes an accurate statement that God does not pervert justice. That's a true statement. But his application of that knowledge is wrong. It, it, it didn't work in that context. Since God did not pervert, does not pervert justice, then Job, you must be wicked, and you're just deserving what you get. It, 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 it's just black and white. If this happens to you, it must mean this. And it, it doesn't matter the pain and the anguish that they're hearing from Job. It's all your fault. And, and Job makes his case. We'll talk about that next week. He, he makes his case. He, he talks about what he's done. He talks about what he hasn't done. No, it's not my wickedness. And so far in his speeches, he's no better than Bildad. He responds to Job's defense, and then he contorts Job's words. In Job chapter 11, verses 4 through 6, we will put these verses up. Zophar says to Job, You say to God, My beliefs are flawless, and I am pure in your sight. Oh, how I wish that God would speak, that he would open his lips against you and disclose to you the secrets of wisdom. For true wisdom has two sides. Know this, God has even forgotten some of your sin. Wow. You've sinned so much that God's forgotten some of it. And Job never said he was flawless. He, he just could not recall a time in his life that he didn't fear God and do what he thought was right. And he just wanted to know, in, in all Job's comments, he just wanted to know, why, God, are you against me? Why is all this happening to me? Job said, do not declare me guilty, but tell me what charges you have against me. Have you ever watched the YouTube cha channels where, and I, I hate this, I, I was a former deputy in the military, I did the law enforcement as well, and there's all these YouTubes with showing a policeman stopping somebody, and the policeman says, can I have your driver's license and ID? Why are you stopping me? Well, you were speeding. Can I have your ID? No, I don't have to give you that. Yes, you do. <laughs> no, this is an illegal, and you, 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 you say, what, what, tell me what the charge is. I told you, you were speeding. And, and, and Job is kind of doing the same thing, but he's not, he's not denying God his ID. <laughs> Saying, what charges do you have against me? Why am I being punished? My friends are telling me I'm evil, but I can't think of a time that, that I haven't feared you. I can't think of a time that I, I didn't work to do what was right. Job had spent a lot of time in his discourses considering his life and his actions and trying to put it all together. Where, where did I go wrong? What did I do that I'm getting this due? The life and the actions of Job that even God saw as one who was blameless and shuns evil. And, and with that understanding and with Job's understanding, all he could say is, why? Why? Why am I going through all the struggles? I, I don't get it. This doesn't, this doesn't make sense. And his friends just keep piling on. No matter what Job says, oh no, you're evil. You're full of sin. God's forgotten your sin. Some of your sins, you're so sinful. And we should, we should learn from this. We should learn that we are not the judges. I think Job summed it up best with regards to this comfort that he is getting from his friends. We'll bring these verses up. Job chapter 16, beginning in verse 2. Job says, I have heard many things like these, you miserable comforters all. Will your long-winded speeches never end? What ails you that you keep on arguing? I could also speak like you if, I, if you were in my place. I could make fine speeches against you and shake my head at you. But my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. There is a time for wise counsel, but that, not, that time is not during struggle and pain. Things need to be able to calm down a bit. 
you may have heard, and it's been attributed to many different people, but it was actually Teddy Roosevelt that once said, nobody cares how much you know until they know how much you care. We can be often too quick to judge, and that's not our job. 2 Corinthians verses, chapter 5, verses 18 through 21 says, it reminds us that when we turn to Jesus in faith and our sins are forgiven, that God has reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us a, the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us a message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Yeah, judgment, judgment is not our task. Ultimately, judgment belongs to who? <laughs> it's, it belongs to God. Vengeance is mine. Reconciling the world by faith in the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus for the forgiveness of sins, that is our mission. That's what we are called to do. And these three friends, they, they started on the right path, consoling their friend by just grieving with him, hugging him, caring for him in that sense. But when the pain and the anguish bubbled up from Job and, and he opened his mouth with his complaint and his why, 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 they pounced. And so the question that we have to ask ourselves is what kind of friends are we? And as I kind of alluded to before, I, I, I catch myself judging at times, sometimes just seeing somebody. Oh, yeah, yeah. Tattoos all over. I start making my judgments. That's wrong. Maybe I don't do it verbally. Maybe I don't, maybe I don't make it you know, obvious, but in my heart, I, I, why can't that person get it together? And judgment seldom brings reconciliation that we're called to be a ministry of. Sometimes it is as simple as asking a question. How can I help you? But judgment falls too easily from our lips. There is a time, and it, I would say this scripturally, there is a time when there is judgment needed. There is a time that we might have to be blunt. It was Jethro to Moses when he saw Moses trying to handle more than he could. He said, what you are doing is wrong. Here's what you should do. There's, there, there is a time for that. But the time is not in the midst of pain. We should desire to be more like Job. But my mouth would encourage you Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. That's not easy. Because we're human. And we tend to judge people by our yardstick. I don't do that. You do, so you're wrong. But my mouth would encourage you. Comfort from my lips would bring you relief. Next week, we're going to look more at Job's complaint and how he responds, but ultimately what we want to look at is God's response. Because Job asks why, and God ultimately responds, and we learn a great deal about life and our position before God by what he's going to say. But the three friends... And like I say, there's actually a younger man that decides he wants to throw in his two cents. I'll probably hit a little bit on that next week. But those three friends gave us an example of what not to do when we're trying to comfort a friend. Sometimes we just need to shut our mouths and listen. Let's pray. Almighty God, we, we need you to reveal your compassion and your love to us every day so that we might be willing to be compassionate to those around us. It is so easy, almighty God, for us to judge those who 
either don't believe or are living a life that is contrary to your will and we don't bring them into reconciliation with you by our judgment. Help us, Lord, to leave judgment to you. Your Holy Spirit, we are told, will convict people of sin and of righteousness. So, Almighty God, help us to stay out of the way and be ready to be used by you as you give us opportunity and open those doors. But Lord, help us to remember that, that you love the world and we're willing to give your life for it. Lord, teach us compassion. Teach us to be ones that are willing to give words that would encourage and that we too would seek to comfort. And Lord, give us the discernment to know when to speak and when to be silent. And guide us, Lord, in all that we do. Lord, thank you for your word. Reveal yourself to us more and more each day as we look into it. These things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.